spot. No, there it is. All right. <laughs> What's up, everybody? How's it going? We are back to the stream. It's Tuesday. We're getting tactical. Hi, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for coming and hanging out. Um, got some stuff to talk about. Uh, I played a tournament this weekend. We got another weekend full of 10th edition um, event results that we can go over. A lot of Eldar, so... We could uh, save ourselves an hour of pointless talking about Eldar uh, if we just skip all of those. But a couple other sort of um, surprise uh, contestants as well, which I'm excited to see. Uh, looks like my music is loud. I'm going to turn that down. Mm, boop. There it is. How's that? I hope that uh, audio is a little better, everybody. Um, so we're, we're... There's a dog outside. I hope that's not I'm picking up a microphone too loud. Um, I hope that, uh, well, well, we're staring down the barrel of the first balance update to the edition. So a lot of these results are kind of up in the air. And I think one thing that would be interesting to straight up a dog barking in my window. All right, we're going to hopefully that makes that quieter. <laughs> I have my window open right now, Chad, because it's kind of hot and humid right now uh, in my little studio. And there's just a neighborhood dog <laughs> just right outside <laughs> um, yelling at me. So, uh, yeah, we can. Uh, I think one thing that we can do is sort of theorize what the metagame is going to look like, assuming that we see some balance changes that uh, have been previewed especially to indirect fire weapons and uh, probably eldar and knights a little bit as well uh, was that inky inky uh fun fact not a dog so she that was not her uh yelling at me <laughs> um well thanks everybody for coming and hanging out haven games question about tts is there already a setup for 10th ed yes um, yeah, so the FTC map base, which is the the base that most everybody basically everybody uses to keep score and spawn objectives and things like that, uh, that is updated for 10th edition. It also can automatically generate your tactical objectives for you. The system is super sweet, so you can go check that out. That is uh, that was actually updated for 10th prior to 10th release. The uh, the team behind that just jumped right on it. It was awesome. Um, you can do single player because the game is basically just a physics engine. So you just spawn two armies and then like play them with yourself, basically. Uh, you can spawn a multiplayer lobby and then do whatever you want with it. So most of the game is just moving models around by yourself. So uh, there's not like hard and fast scripting to keep you to the to the rules or anything like that. Um, can we look at one Eldar list? So I think, well, the, here's the thing right now is that, uh, so, I mean, if we if we pop over to our uh, lists right now, um, I think for the most part, most of the lists we're gonna be looking at are very heavily based on this Wraith, like Wraith Devastating Wounds builds. Um, and uh, I guess this one's not so much. Uh, oh no, it has decan support on platforms. So I, I think r right now, uh, I don't. <laughs> you're gonna be hard pressed to find a list that doesn't um, that doesn't you know heavily use the devastating wounds interaction. Now I, I guess to be fair, there are some Eldar lists that are a little bit more uh, sort of MSU oriented. And if we wanted to pop one out, I don't know if there are any in the results for uh, from this weekend. I do know uh, there are some in online events, and I'll see if I can pull one up. We can look at one Eldar list uh, that is currently um, in play, if I can find it super fast. All right. So here's something similar. Um, this is Max Squiss from an online event that uh, I'm in. He's over from the Try Hard Discord server, which has most of the uh, most competitive players in um, the UK typically play there. Uh, and this is a list that's not, it, it's a it's a Yanari list, um, but and it's not based on sort of spamming devastating wounds. It's mostly based on the MSU. Uh, and one thing that I think I, I'd like to talk about today, <laughs> and hence the title of the video, is that I think if Eldar get get cut down a notch, the next faction that we'll see, and, and Knights, obviously, the next faction that we'll see do very well is 
something like Gene Stealer Cults. Um, and I think a list like this is a way that you can um, beat those very high volume, high model count armies like Gene Stealer Cults. So uh, it's Yvrain, Incarn, one Farseer with the Phoenix Gem to respawn it. I don't believe it has an attachment because there's no Guardians in this list. So you just have the Phoenix Gem, and if your opponent decides to waste anti tank on, or uh, indirect fire on it, you just respawn it. Um, uh, death, uh, just, just, death Jester, uh, three Night Spinners to add your own indirect fire. Those have Devastating Wounds, but that's not a unit that I would expect to see changed. Like, that's not a unit that typically uses a lot of Fate Dice to de to, to trigger Devastating Wounds because it has Twin Linked. Um, it may see points increases, and we may see the indirect fire mechanics changed, but I don't know if the Night Spinner itself is something I would expect to, like, have a rework. But then the remainder of the list is units that basically small units that move a lot. So we have three units of Scourges with Dark Lances. They have like a baked in fire and fade. Um, so they can, uh, they can, you know, shoot and then scoot themselves around. One benefit that you have against Gene Stealer Cults here is that you can um, potentially kill units and then move up to their um, tokens that they leave their their cult ambush tokens so your opponent has to really like sort of back drop their cult ambush tokens and you have a lot of opportunity to kill them uh so there's three units of scourges that do that there's three units of shadow specters that also do that uh and then warp spiders which can just move like sort of infinitely infinite distance and and a list like this i think is something that i would expect to see eldar play if we see all of the big heavy armor get nerfed um, because it plays secondaries extremely well. It's super fast. And a lot of people, because Imperial Knights and, you know, Wraith Knights and stuff are so powerful right now, people are teching to kill single high resilience targets. And so you kind of just like circumvent that by playing a bunch of five model units that um, individually you don't really care about. They're all like 100 points. So if your opponent points this huge Death Star unit at a five model Shadow Spectre squad, you're not that worried about it. Um, and then obviously it's really good at scoring objectives. So that is uh, a list that doesn't use those devastating wounds interactions that I think uh, people could uh, people could, could hop on for sure. MSU is good against Osa moment too. Yeah, I think so for sure. I also think that um, I mean, Desolators are good either way into those armies, but I imagine we see Desolators get changed. Because the Desolator squad getting plus one on its D3 shot weapon can split fire and just kill two or three of those units at a time. So that is, I think, problematic, but a lot of that stuff deep strikes, so you're not, you can kind of get around it. All right. Anyway, chat. The Rocket Space Marines are broken? Yeah, I, I would expect to see Desolators changed uh, for sure. Ooh, my light's in the way. Get my camera resituated here. Um... Especially if we see indirect fire, I don't know, because Desolators ignore the indirect fire penalty. I don't know how they they make them worse without just like supercharging their points value. I am a little bit worried for Space Marines though. One thing that we can look at as we look at sort of trends here in these top these top three um, to top five finishes is that basically no Space Marines are are going. Um, or I don't want to say like no Space Marines are going X one. No Space Marines are getting top three in their events. Uh, and I think that maybe speaks to the fact that they're not very good at secondaries. Their units are kind of expensive, and they don't have a lot of those like really, really cheap utility units. Um, so if Desolators get hit, Space Marines might be on in sort of dire straits. Uh, we'll see, though. I do think Space Marines are definitely at the top of kind of the mid-tier of the metagame right now, but Eldar is pushing everyone out currently, so it's hard to get a good idea of how um good other factions are besides eldar but we do see a lot of these gene stealer cults in uh this top you know this this sort of x1 bracket uh you just look here at the alpine cup through <laughs> every, every non undefeated uh army at the top here i guess uh besides this one which was technically undefeated with two draws uh <laughs> ran gene stealer cults <laughs> uh which is wild so that's pretty good Space Marines are gatekeepers. That's probably a good way to put it. I think so. I think that's the, that's fair. I would like to see Space Marines. Um, I mean, really, I think part of the problem is that Space Marines, like, their other unit archetypes got hit super hard for, for kind of no reason. Uh, you know, basically, Space Marine melee is really, really bad for uh, uh, for whatever reason. Like, I don't know. Um, and their armor is okay, but it is kind of expensive. 
So, uh, you know, your vehicle lists for Space Marines aren't amazing like they are with Chaos Space Marines. Uh, so I, I think I'd like to see kind of the heavy infantries for Space Marines a, a, a little bit buffed, but I don't know what we'll get in the uh, new edition. When Thunderfire Cannons not to be caught in a nerf that's unintended for them? I mean, it'd be okay if Thunderfire Cannons got squatted. <laughs> Um, anything with the indirect fire keyword is probably problematic, to be fair. Uh, so should we hop into some list chat? I think most of these Gene Stealer cult lists are going to be largely the same. Um, double Nexos, double Primus for your big uh, Neophyte hybrid squads. Uh, a Biophagus with Inscrutable Cunning, so that gives um, Infiltrator to a unit and like, gives you a 4 plus CP regen on them. Uh, and then so he goes into an Aberrant unit. Yeah, there's a big aberrant unit for that guy. So that forward deploys up in your opponent's face. They have a four plus feel no pain. So you can sort of deploy them kind of um, aggressively and your opponent probably can't kill them. And then the Adel and Jackals uh, do mortal wounds and they move within six inches of you. And you can uh, potentially do that multiple times um, because they can... Um, they have a pregame move. They have a reactive move thanks to the uh, Prowling Adjutant on the Jackal Alphas, and they have a uh, move, a fire and fade move. So they move three, uh, you know, normally three times a turn, and they can do mortal wounds every time they move. They average about 15 uh, or 16 over the course of a single turn. It's a little bit difficult to get off, though. And to be fair, the unit's expensive. Uh, with all of their wolf quads and everything, it's 225 points. Is that right? 235, and I think plus the enhancement, so it's like around two. No, it's, all, it's getting close to 300, um, which is a lot of points. It is a lot of mortal wounds, but the unit usually dies immediately. <laughs> and then they can't really do that anymore because the Jackal Office leaves the unit once they're dead. Uh, but it is extremely strong. And, you know, long, a, a large, uh, it's a physically large unit, so it can kind of pin you in your deployment zone too. And then Gene Steeler College just score a bunch of secondaries. There, there may be. One of the better factions in the game in scoring secondaries, the Neophyte Hybrid Bricks um, are incredibly annoying to deal with because they'll pop up, they'll supercharge their guns and shoot you. And then uh, with the um, Nexus plus the Primus, they are always representing a free full reroll Overwatch. So even if they just stand in front of your army, if anything moves, they can probably, uh, if not kill, cripple a second unit. Um, uh with the sh with the, the overwatch shot so they can really kind of um make it difficult to engage into and then they're currently sort of forcing the aberrants at you plus the ridge runner can add plus one ap with the mortar by just shooting somebody it's overall pretty good combination but um right now i think they are being sort of kept at bay a little bit by this indirect fire and by you know stuff like eldar that are just able to use like you know the, this high mortal wound output artillery to, to sort of keep them down um, not to mention like Phantasm's huge, I think in that matchup, because it's, you can, you can potentially get around, um, units arriving at the end of your movement phase, uh, or you can, you can get around units deep striking in at obnoxious places in your opponent's movement phase, um, because by moving it after they show up. So, uh, one thing that Gene Steeler Cults can do is because they can make themselves unshootable, um, with one with the shadows, I think is the name of the stratagem. You can phantasm into range to shoot them uh, on your on your your subsequent turn. So you can you can you have reactive play that gets around their um, their chicanery. It's still not a great matchup for Eldar because they can be sort of immune to indirect fire at least on a couple units. Um, but they have they certainly have the tools to deal with it. And I think that once Eldar get knocked down, I do think Gene Stiller Call may be the best faction. Uh, is is maybe where we're angling. We'll see how things end up. Uh, and Imperial Knights, I guess, obviously, for sure. The, yeah, yeah, this, uh, yeah, the Alpine Leader board is just pretty nuts. Um, there were, yeah, there were very few uh, factions, not of these two in there. Feels like you play, can't play primary mission versus Jane Center Call. Yeah, there's a, yeah, that is, uh, 
Not entirely wrong. They definitely dominate the primary against you. And having lots of deep striking units uh, means that they also play the secondary very well. So it's very much like the previous editions of Gene Steeler Cult, where, and I kind of, honestly, I, I kind of like the design of the faction, where it does have decent damage output, right? That you can do mortal wounds, you can wombo combo the neophyte squads to blow stuff up, but most of the time, they don't, they don't, they don't do that much damage. Like they'll kill their, the thing that they're shooting at the turn that they they arrive if they're fully buffed, um, and if it doesn't have super tough defensive stats. But it's not like an in, you know in incomparable amount of damage. It's it's sort of pretty reasonable, especially once you you dump two characters and a ton of CP into them. Um, and then they all live, they all vaporize, and then they they. they they're sort of expecting to lose their whole army several times over the course of the game, which is kind of interesting. And it's a little bit fun to play against because you just get to keep killing people. Uh, but for the most part, it doesn't really matter. And then they just can keep showing up on, on primary objectives, which is obnoxious. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, so, but anyway, we've talked about Jesus Taylor Call. We've talked about Eldar. I think most of the Jesus Taylor Call lists are going to look very similar. The Eldar lists are mostly like using Devastating Wound stuff right now. Um, but there are going to be some other lists that we can look at from different factions, which I think uh, I am much more interested to talk about. So let's dive in to some different ones. We got a 5 0 Astro Militar, we got a 5 0 Death Guard. This is an exciting one because all the Death Guard people are, are sad. Uh, a couple Tyranids at 4 and 1, um, uh, an Orc, some Blood Angels. So I, the other thing that I think is kind of heartening about these results is that you can very, you can see that if you reduce the power level, of the top factions in the game to the mid the mid line the mid range where a lot of the factions are sitting you actually get to a meta game that's like almost healthy and kind of interesting i i i actually think that a lot of factions are competitive and it's just these like domineering factions that are at the top that are ruining it for everyone. That said, I, I mean, there are a couple like uh, Astromil, or uh, not Astromil, uh, Adeptus Mechanicus are just like so sad and Leagues of Votan are so sad. Um, I'd like to see the bottom five addressed as well in this upcoming balance patch, but I don't know if that's as pressing an issue currently as it is, uh, as the, the top factions are. So uh, what should we start with chat? Tyranids, should we, should we talk about some Astromil Tarm? Do I know about the weird house rule in the event with Astromil Tarm one? I actually do. Actually, yeah, we can talk about that. Um, I wonder if we can find their player pack so we can talk about it. Um, mm -mm 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 -mm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a, a quick look. See here, they do have a player pack. Oh, they want my, f they want my. F what the fuck? They want my phone number so that I'm not gonna give you my phone number. Geelong Town Open. Oh, here it is. It's on WordPress. Nice. Oh, they just... Well, they talk about the missions that they played, so that's interesting, I guess. But that's about all we get. That's not that useful. All right. <laughs> Death Guard are unplayable. So bad, for sure. Uh, all right. Dark Man Pie said Tyranids, so let's talk about Tyranids. We can run through some Tyranid lists. So Dylan Cohen with Tyranids. This is a Geelong Town Open. Uh, something borrowed, something eaten, I guess, right? Um, so we're running Death Leaper, a Hive Tyrant with Alien Cunning. So that's the redeploy Warlord trait, which does require a little bit of house ruling to work because currently it is it is up in the air whether or not redeploys take place I feel like I tried to fix my camera and I didn't. I feel like my camera just constantly drifts. Um, it's currently unclear whether or not redeploys take place after the roll to go first or after the deployment step is completed. If if they take place before the roll to go first after deployment's completed, they're basically not very worth, worthwhile very much at all. They can screen out your opponents for a deploy and then pull back to their deployment zone, but that's about the only use case they have. And, and especially for the tiered one, which is like a 35 or 45 point enhancement, which is nuts. Um, you, you just never play it. Uh, if you if you um, play it where you can redeploy before uh, after the roll to go first before the first turn, it's actually incredibly strong, um, especially because a lot of the tier to damage dealers right now are very slow. So you can if you're going first, you can deploy them at the front and then push them forward. 
Um, so we have a hive tyrant uh, with alien cunning. I actually, I, this is an open question whether or not you take a hive tyrant or swarm lord. I think the hive tyrant gives you more command points over the course of the game because you get to use two, you get to use a stratagem offensively and a stratagem defensively, and you're almost always using rapid regeneration defensively. So you're basically plus five CP from that automatically. And it lets you do two in a turn and you get offensive stratagems as well. Uh, mostly you can use, um, like, uh, the, the five plus critical, um, hyper adaptation, I think. Oh no, adrenaline surge, I think is what it's called. Uh, which gives you five plus critical hits in melee on two units, which is mostly what you, you use with the hive tyrant offensively. Uh, we are running barb guns to slow down enemy infantry. This is pretty good against slower armies like adeptus custodies, I think, that, that are like super tough super um, aggressive melee infantry. Barbgons can really shut those units down, but in a lot of matchups, they're a little bit dead. Although for 50 points, they bring enough shots that they can still sort of contribute anyway. Um, three individual biovores. These guys are kind of required because they can, they're can. they currently how Tyranid score points. Uh, you can score secondary objectives with your spore mines. So you can drop spore mines 48 inches away from the biovore, and you can score like engage in all fronts, behind enemy lines. You can deploy teleport homers with them. They're super strong. We do have two Carnifexes with Bioplasma um, and uh, just a just a bunch of uh, Heavy Venom Cannons as well. So shooty Carnifexes with Old One Eye. Old One Eye gives them rerolls on both their melee and ranged attacks. So pushing as many ranged attacks as you can into that unit makes them a little bit dangerous. Two Exocrines to give reroll ones. Two Haraspexes because they're cheap and your opponent has to shoot them. Uh, Pyrovores to ignore cover. And then look at that gorgeous three inches zone throps. That's only nine zone throps. Could be more. We're, we're, we're leaving, we're keeping things a little bit. Oh, is it? No, no, it's, uh, sorry. It's 12 sound throws. There's one unit of six. Um, keeping things a little bit, uh, more reasonable today, I guess. But, um, the zone throws are definitely the, the, uh, the hard carry of the Tyranid matchup between these guys and Biofors. They're basically, you know, what's keeping Tyranids alive right now. Uh, they're just, they have a laser cannon. They're 30 points model. Um, you can get ignore cover from the Pyrovore, get reroll ones from the Exocrine. You get assault from the Hive Tyrant as well. So that even the, just the fact that they're move five, they can then advance and shoot. Uh, and that just makes them pretty solid. Um, not much else to say there. This is basically a standard Tyranid list for 10th edition. <laughs> I think based, most Tyranid lists you look at are going to be pretty similar to that. Um, let's look at some of the other ones. There was another one up here. Um, this one ran both a Hive Tyrant with Alien Cunning and the Swarm Lord. Hot diggity damn. Two barbed Hyra duels. Oh, I bet there's some people who are creaming their pants over this list. <laughs> two barbed Tyrodil. So these are the shooty Hyrodil variety. They shoot each 2d6 plus 6, I believe. Um, strength 9, AP 2, 2 damage shots that suppress for minus 1 to hit. Um, and they are, they're uh, a bunch of wounds. 18 wounds, I think, with a 2 plus save. And they're, they're voluminously very large, so they almost always have cover. So they're basically a 1 plus save. They're not the easiest thing to kill. Uh, they're they are a little pricey for what you get, but with the the like number of shots you get from them, plus um, getting access to either sustained hits or lethal hits against uh, infantry or, or monsters, depending on what you adapt for at the start of the game, um, they can actually like high volume decent damage shooting isn't isn't too bad. Uh, we then have two biovores to score secondaries, two haraspexes because they're cheap, and then two maliceptors. <laughs> Let's go. So the Malice is a weird one. Uh, it has a pretty solid gun by itself. It's a strength 10, three damage, I believe. I'm gonna, I'm gonna double check that real quick. Uh, but it also, here's my Tyranid index. Um, it also, if you're able to push it far enough forward, um, it can defend the rest of your army because your, your opponent basically can't get within six inches of it. Uh, so it itself, has. Let's just pull up its data sheet real quick here. Um, yeah, so it's a it's a strength 10 AP2, 3 damage blast attack, and you can buff that with like Exocrines and Pyrobores and stuff like that, obviously. It is only 18 inch range, so it's not usually in range on turn 1, but we do have that Hive Tyrant so it can advance and fire it, which does give it a pretty long threat range. It's going to go 27 to 20, 27 to 32 inches, which is solid. Um, 
but then what you want is uh, to trigger is the sense of active fusion. So so when enemies get within six inches of it, you get minus one to hit and minus one to wound if you're below half strength. So if you're pushing the malice scepters as far forward as you can, you're protecting them. You know they're T11, they have a four plus invuln save, they have 14 wounds. You're protecting them with potentially two uses of rapid regeneration for a five plus damage ignore because they are synapse, so they're always going to be benefiting from the five plus version of the strat, not the four plus or not the six plus. Um, they they survive for a long time and and they sort of screen out the front of the army from the the front of the table from your opponent so they can sort of act as your as your your frontline presence and they can keep enemies off of the um the high duels so that the high duels can and stuff can keep shooting i think the mouse is pretty interesting uh I, I almost wonder if, if we'll start to see them replace Haru Spexes, because the Haru Spex is cheap. Uh, the Malaceptors are 35 more points, I think. I think they're 160. Yeah, they're 40 points more. Um, but the, the Haru Spex I found is, is not quite survivable enough. And without the Invulnerable save, with only a 3 plus armor, they kind of fall apart. Um, and the Malaceptor, while it doesn't do any damage in melee, uh, it does have that range attack that you can kind of get some work out of. So, um, I mean, I think, you know, they sort of cover each other's bases because the horror specs can disincentivize people from engaging you. But um, I do, I wonder how, how much we're going to see the Malice Hunter sort of start to replace them. Uh, is the Scythe Tyra Duel any good? I, it seems okay on Overwatch uh, just because it has a big flamethrower. Uh, the downside is that you... I think you trade the the cost the value is the same because if I remember correctly both high dual varieties are the same points and you basically trade like a couple melee attacks and a little bit of speed for for the, a big long range gun and that's tyranids are are largely like they operate within this 18 to 24 inch range so the barbed high dual gives you access to a big gun that's high volume and is like not too bad whereas the scythe tyro dual is just a purely offensive piece so I think the the place of the side tyro duel mostly just is taken up by the Horus backs, which is almost you know like what a th almost thirty like percent of its point cost. Um, but but and they have like a not dissimilar damage output in melee, and that you can still fight in melee with the barbed tyro duel. It's just not quite as good and not quite as fast, but it's shooting the entire game. So I think the barbed tyro duel just sort of uh, outclasses it most of the time. Um, especially, uh, there's a little bit of weirdness too because the, the, like the the Scythe Tyrodol has its spray attack, which is a good anti-infantry weapon. Um, it doesn't benefit from any of your uh, detachment abilities because it doesn't get lethal or sustained hits because it's a Toro weapon. Um, and if you're trying to clear infantry, the blast keyword, you know, blast plus sustained hits is basically just better than torrenting anyway. Especially because if you have uh, uh, Biovore, or um, uh, uh, the shoot, the shooting guy, <laughs> um, Exocrine, excuse me. Uh, you can you can get rerolls on it anyway, so its its accuracy isn't that much worse. It's worse in Overwatch, obviously, but like Blast just sort of counters infantry passively, so you don't need to build for these torrent profiles to do so. Uh, plus, we also we already have a torrent weapon and a train effects, which is actually um, unironically just harder to kill than the. Um, the uh scythe tyro duel because it has this it's it loses um a couple of wounds i think it's 16 wounds right uh but it gets minus one damage and then it has the same otherwise the same defensive stat line yeah 16 wounds they're both at a two plus save um but this one reduces damage by one at t12 Um, so I, I wouldn't say the Scythe Tyro Duel is like bad to, to answer the question, but I think the Barbed Tyro Duel just is a, actually offers something that, that the faction really needs. Um, all right. I think that's all the Tyranids. What do we want to talk about next, chat? Adoptus Custodes? I got some Custodes. We got some Blood Angels. Should we dive into the, this, that, this Death Guard list? What are we, uh, what are we thinking? Well, one eye with two DAC effects is the full shooting, shooting setup. Bioplasma to Devours is disgusting. So the, there's a little bit of weirdness, right? Because the, the Devours actually aren't that high shot volume, if I remember correctly. Kind of um, the, the issue, I think, uh, in my opinion, is that they're AP zero. 
Um, none of the Carnifex's weapons are particularly high AP, which is why I don't love them. And I actually just started running Carnifex's entirely with melee because their <laughs> ranged attacks are kind of worthless. Uh, so... So the... Um, the issue is... that you replace your scything talons with one devour and then you replace your regular scything talons with one more devour and the devourers um oh they are two base 12 shots yeah, yeah. so you're shooting 24 times and not winning so it's not too bad but you're only ap0 um so i don't know it seems okay, but I think your opponent's just gonna see about a bit. I guess the big the benefit is that like being AP zero, you don't you're not that worried about cover a lot of times because against a three plus save, you're basically AP one. Um, but if you're against a two plus save, you just cry, <laughs> just cry yourself to sleep. And then once you get it to melee, uh, I found that old one eye by himself usually isn't enough to kill a tank. Um, you need Carnifexes to help out, and old one eye plus one Carnifex can kill most things that he engages. But uh, just old one eye is a little bit tough. So I think that uh, honestly, the 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 most efficient play pattern to me that, that I've found has just been placing Carnifexes with with rapid re uh, rapid ingress out of strategic reserve into annoying places where your opponent can shoot it with one thing that you can then um, reactive move towards. And uh, you know, obviously they can screen if offensively, but your guns are all low, you know, low range, so you'll just shoot them because that forces them to move into your, your threat range. Um, and then you just rapid ingress into an annoying place and they get a, a charge on the, on the subsequent turn. Has usually been, uh, I found where Carnifexes get the best work out of. I don't know if I'm that interested in shooting with them. But I guess they are, they're good um, overwatchers, I guess, right? Because they shoot like, they'll each shoot like 15 times with full rerolls. So that's something, that's not too bad. Are you ready to admit the Tyranids are better than Space Marines? Not even a little bit. <laughs> That's uh, ridiculous. Problem with Tyrion is that the army roll is useless. Um, yeah, the army roll is really bad. It might be the worst single army roll out of all of the factions. But, I mean, Synapse is good. You kind of get two army rolls. Because Synapse is one of them, right? And then Shadow in the Warp is the other one. And Shadow in the Warp is basically nothing. Um, but Synapse is solid. So, I don't know. It's not too bad. Uh, all right. We talked about we want to talk about Blood Angels? All right. We're on this Blood Angels list. Let's go. Um, so, this is a 4-1 list. In the 40k Brawl. We have a jump pack captain with artificer armor, so it gives him a two plus armor save and a feel no pain. Dante himself, Lamardi's to babysit the Death Company. We're basically the Death Company show, I think, with Blood Angels now, because they are um, have sort of retained their their output, but um, didn't get the same sort of wild cost increase that we saw in Sanguinary Guard. So if you're playing Blood Angels units, um, you are, unfortunately, almost always in Gladius Task Force because the Gladius Task Force synergizes better with Blood Angels units than the Blood Angels detachment does, which is a little bit weird. Um, you don't get, like, the plus one attack and strength on the charge, but you get access to um, Assault Doctrine and uh, Honor the Chapter, which gives you uh, Lance and plus one AP if you're in Assault Doctrine. And so for two CP, and we do have a Captain, so we can do one of those for free, um, you can... Get, put yourself, put a unit into Assault Doctrine and then give it Lance and plus one AP. So it's actually, it's faster and doing more damage than Blood Angels would be in their own detachment, which is just like, okay. <laughs> uh, so we have a bunch of Sanguinary Priests, two Sanguinary Priests, um, and then a bunch of just regular allied Assault Squads with Jump Packs. Um, looks like two Ten Men with Eviscerators and Flamers. A ball predator with a flame storm cannon. Wild. Plus 10 death company marines of jump packs. That's what Lamartis is going to jump into. Who grants them, if I remember correctly, uh, a minus one wound effect. I'm going to pull over my 
Um, Blood Angels document here. Um, oh, excuse me, minus one damage. Yeah, so so they already have a feel no pain, a six plus feel no pain baked in because they're death company, and then he also reduces incoming damage, so he can make it so that even like high, like two damage blast weapons don't immediately kill the whole unit. Um, they're actually relatively resilient against that kind of shooting, which is good for uh, normally a squad that would just be sort of the standard uh, marine profile. Um, and then a bunch of power fists on them because power fists are basically the if you're if you're pushing for melee attacks, the power fists are basically the direction to go in. Uh, we then have the, uh, of course, 10-man Desolation Squad. I don't think we have an attachment for them. No. Uh, Premier's Apothecary pulled just one, yeah. So he's going to jump into the unit. He's going to give them um, sustained one and critical fives if they're in Devastator Doctrine. And again, you can adapt the strategy them into Devastator Doctrine so that they can they can critical on... Uh, they can sustained one on fives with all their shots. So they get a billion, million shots. Uh, an Incursor Squad for plus one to hit. An Eradicator Squad just to blow up a tank one time. Looks like just four models. Three. Oh, three. Just three models. Two. Two regular Eradicators and a Sergeant. That's hard to read. But I guess you can clean it from the points value. Um, I'm interested in this Ball Predator. Um, It has... Ooh, this is a very small data sheet. So it has the Flamestorm Cannon, which is a D6 plus three damage, uh, D3, D6 plus three shot torrent weapon. And it, so it's basically just the um, Land Raider Redeemer. It's the same weapon, I think. Uh, is the Redeemer 12 inch range? This one's 18, I think it might be. And then on its side sponsons, it gets additional heavy flamers. So it's kind of an overwatch machine, I guess, is what we're looking for. Um, it's firing 2d6 heavy flamer shots plus d6 plus 3 flamestorm cannon shots. Um, and it gets assault against infantry, so it's relatively fast as well. For 125 points, I think I, I can see the appeal for sure. If you're expecting that you're going to be blowing up tanks by charging them with chainsword and power fist guys and then get like dumping a bunch of buff abilities onto them, um, plus you have like super crack missiles and eradicators. Uh, then you don't necessarily need to build your armor to clear that stuff. And just having a ball predator that just basically wins fights against utility units is super sweet. So I actually kind of like that. 125 for that little guy. Hmm. Hmm. That's pretty good. I guess you can also blow, like, just shoot at tanks those moment. That's probably good. All right, to chat, kind of like that. Um, Shadow has the Shadow in the Warp has the potential to deny primary scoring chat, but you have no control over it is the problem. So it it could potentially stop your opponent from scoring, but it is unlikely to do so, and you can't you you don't have any control over if it does or doesn't. So it's not like a tool in your toolbox. It's like an occasional random thing that's nice to have. Uh, which isn't, like, a great army ability. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Oza Moment or uh, Strands of Fate, it is not. <laughs> yeah, it has... Um, it is nice to see those guys back. Uh, Grey Knights next? I don't think we have any Grey Knights today. We can do some deep dives into some... If we have extra time, we can do some deep dives into RTTs and stuff and, and lower ranking players, but uh, right now we're on the top threes. What are we thinking? Do we, uh, do we rip the Band-Aid off this Death Guard list, or do we jump into Orcs? We also have Adeptus Custodes. Um, it is a little bit sad that we're in, I guess, like, for this week, right? It was Eldar, Gene Steeler, Cults, Imperial Knights, Tyranids, Orcs, Death Guard, Space Marines, and Custodes, if I don't remember if I already said that. We're the only, the only um, factions to top three. You gotta get these Eldar players out of here. You get these Eldar players out of here... It's going to look a lot nicer. <laughs> Death Guard? All right. We'll jump into Death Guard. All right. Aiden Smalley with Death Guard. So this is, a, this is an interesting one. Um, 
It's a little bit different than you would expect, but there's some interesting synergies in it. So, and also, um, if I remember correctly, uh, I did go through this guy's pairings earlier, and I may do a video that deep dives into uh, the armies that he played against. But he beat, um, at, I th he beat Imperial Knights, and I think he might have beat Eldar to get to the, this position, which was pretty wild. Um, so uh, it's, we got more Tarion in there already. Pretty Chad, right? Seems good. Uh, we have Typhus. So Typhus is going to enter a big unit of Poxwalkers. We have a 20 man Poxwalker, 20 zombie Poxwalker unit, I guess. And Typhus with the Poxwalkers is an interesting synergy. So the Poxwalkers regenerate models when they kill people in melee, right? Because they're zombies. And so they, they give you the zombie bite and then you turn into a zombie. Um, when Typhus enters the unit, he makes the minus one to be hit in melee. Then also in the shooting phase, he has a, basically a vortex of doom that he can cast and his vortex of doom counts as a, a poxwalker melee attack for the purposes of poxwalkers regenerating themselves so he can you can shoot at the poxwalkers and he can constantly be regenerating models of the unit if he's killing your infantry uh which is super sick so the typhus plus the poxwalker brick for um what 235 points actually seems like a like a solid a solid uh, unit especially given the fact that they're not soup they're not the easiest thing in the world to kill they have a five plus feel no pain so against one damage attacks um, like a lot of anti-infantry blast attacks, they'll bounce it a lot of times. Um, and you have to wipe the unit to prevent them from coming back, and Typhus is going to constantly regenerate them. Uh, I don't know if Typhus's melee attacks also regenerate models. I assume that it would, but I don't know what the wording there is. Um, I don't know if it if their ability requires Poxwalkers to kill the person or just anyone in their unit. Let's find out. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. I can't find them. There they are. Oh my god. What just happened? Holy shit. That was weird. I was on the data sheet and then I wasn't. There they are. Um, it is a model in this unit to destroy an enemy model. It's not a monster vehicle. So you can... So Typhus himself could just like sweep his... his um, uh, man Reaper around. His Mastercrafted Man Reaper. He also has, a, if I remember correctly, a 3 damage melee attack. Uh, which is pretty solid. Yeah, he's strength 9, AP 2, 3 damage. And you have to remember that you're, if you're fighting them, you're in contagion range. So you're also minus on toughness. So he actually wounds T9 on 3s and T10 on 4s. So he's a solid like anti-vehicle profile. Or he can just swing 10 times and kill a bunch of people to regenerate models to the unit. Um, so that, that little combination of units is actually, uh, probably a sleeper, I think, in this faction. Um, we then have, uh, in addition to that, we have, uh, a bunch of individual Death Shroud Terminator units. So two little three-man Death Shroud Terminators with their Plague Burst, uh, Plague Spurts. They do have, like, Flamer weapons, which is solid. Um, and you can give them wound rerolls by attaching people. Uh, two units of cultists. Uh, Death Guard cultists are a little bit weird. They're the only cultists that don't have any <laughs> special abilities. All of the other Chaos Cultist varieties have a special effect that they give. Um, like the Thousand Suns ones uh, give you command points back. The World Eaters ones, um, I think, have a Feel No Pain and uh, do something else. The, the regular Chaos Cultists have objective secured, but these ones get objective secured because they're in a Death Guard detachment, which is good. Um, so it, it's a little bit weird, but at least they get their detachment abilities. Uh, we have a Lord of Virulence, Virulence to go into one of those, um, Death Rod Terminator units. And the other one, uh, takes a Death Guard Sorcerer. Uh, so the Lord of Virulence gives you wound rerolls, uh, if I remember correctly. So your little Plague Spurt unit can, um, just blast out Flamer attacks. The, uh, Terminator Sorcerer is very weird. Um, he has, unfortunately, kind of a... Uh, borked psychic ability. Um, if we take a look at his um, his data sheet here, uh, his psychic ability gives you minus one damage in the fight phase. So it basically on a two plus automatically um, disgustingly resilience your unit, but it requires you to select a target. It just doesn't do anything with the target. So you select an enemy unit within 18 inches invisible then give yourself minus one damage and it's not minus one damage against like from attacks against that target and it's not minus one damage for attacks that that target makes it's minus one damage to your own unit um but it's from any source 
uh, until the end of the fight phase. So even if you select somebody 18 inches away and um, it, like they, they don't reduce damage on their ranged attacks, you just reselect them in your next fight phase. And he doesn't do anything to prevent shooting. Uh, it's like super bizarre. <laughs> um, it, I think the functionally, I think it means that basically you can't be fighting someone through a wall and trigger this ability if you have nothing in visibility, but that's that's the only restriction. Otherwise, in any other situation, you would just select the enemy unit that's fighting you because you can see them in there within 18 inches. So that one's a little bit funky, but it does make your unit a little bit tougher to kill. Um, his ranged weapon's okay. It's a it's an awkwardly non-torrent 2d6 shot weapon, but you can improve it to strength 8, 2 damage, or 3 damage once per game, which is solid. Um, but I don't know. He's a little bit of a weird, a weird dude. Uh, and then, yeah, we have, um, um, a, a bunch of Plague Marines, just regular Plague Marines in a Rhino. The two units of cultures talked about, the two units of Dreshrod Terminators talked about, three Plague Burst Crawlers, which I think you basically windmill slam into every list. Them and the Mephitic Blight Haulers are the ones that I think have, have sort of been, like, the standouts for me in this faction. Um, Death Guard, like, their units are kind of mediocre, but their armor is very good. Uh, or I, would, I don't want to say very good, but their armor is solid. So I think their vehicle, their vehicle game plan is okay. Um, and then plus you have the Lord of Virulence in there, who's going to buff their indirect fire as long as he can see the target. And if he's in just a small unit, you can get like good rapid ingresses or good, um, what's the word? Um, the deep strikes to get good lines of sight to people to then bluff all the the pre crawler shots. The interesting thing about this is that uh, it feels a little bit light on anti tank, but clearly um, Aiden didn't let that stop him because he was able to continue to to go um, undefeated at this event, which is pretty, pretty sweet. Um, you don't have it when you're too far away from enemies. Well, you never get it in shooting anyway. It only affects you in the fight phase. So the requirement of having an enemy at, within 18 inches of you to reduce damage to you in the fight phase is pretty weird. Uh, so I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, nerfs to indirect could hit Plague Wars Crawlers. I agree with that, for sure. Yeah, Hellbrutes are, are also great in Death Guard. I do like that they... Um, the the design, I mean, for all the Chaos sub-factions, has been sweet because, like, you know, obviously the Cultists all have special abilities like we just talked about, but the Hellbrutes also, you know, and Demon Princes also bring their own effects to the table. And I think that's really cool, and that's really given all, all of them, like, a, a new lease on life. Um, the Hellbrutes in... Uh, this faction in particular reduce they automatically put you in in gifted Nurgle range if they shoot you so you can tag somebody with like a twin link glass cannon and then reduce their toughness by one for when all the plague wars the the PBCs shoot you the the interesting part is that it doesn't like the the toughness differential doesn't matter too much because um, a lot of your weapons are like strength ten so reducing toughness. You have to be toughness 10 or 11 to be reduced, which is not a large, like for it to matter, which is not a huge swath of the game, but it is what it is. It's still pretty good. Um, several people had their scores adjusted round one at this event, the, uh, the Grand Slam. That's weird. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, we also have orcs to talk about. Inky's here, by the way. Inky, you want to come say hi to chat? Come on. Yeah, you love chat. Whoa. Here she is. You can tell how much she uh, she loves being picked up like that. Hi, chat. Aw, I got a purr. That's cute. You're a good cat. Yeah. Um, all right, we talk about some orcs. Let's dive into those orcs. Go down. There you go. If it was supposed to wound enemies in contagion range, I think it might be too good. <laughs> that might that might swing too far. I almost wonder if it should have been minus two toughness because functionally that is plus one to wound, but only like in specific situations. I don't know. Or maybe like, 
I don't know, rerolls or something. It is a little bit weird that they granted them... They granted the army lethal hits, like, as a faction mechanic. Like, basically every weapon has lethal hits, and then gave them something that made their wound rolls better. A little bit of anti-synergy going on there, but whatever. Uh, all right, Tom Higginbottom playing Oryx over here. Uh, I think we're going to be spamming trucks today. We only have the one character with Follow Me Lads, so he makes his uh, unit faster when he joins them. And then one, two, three, four, five units of Orc Boys. One, two, three, four, five, six trucks. So five units of boys in trucks, plus probably a knob squad. One commando unit to pregame, uh, forward deploy. I don't know if I love the commandos. I think they're like they're kind of a little all or nothing. Um, the fact that you have to take 10 now, rather than being able to take multiples of five, is a little weird. Because if your opponent has the ability to punish your pre, your forward deployment, your infiltrator deployment, that they, they'll just kill all 10 commandos. <laughs> There's not much you can do about it, which is a, a little sad. But it is good to screen out enemy forward deployment and, you know, lock in objectives and stuff like that, two secondaries. Uh, one unit of Gretchen. Love these dudes. Um, that's two units of commandos. Hot damn. Plus the knob squad. That's probably what gets the uh, war boss as well to make them faster. Three units of Squid Hog Boys. One of six. Big, big Squid Hog Boy unit. Um, one unit of Storm Boys. Or three units of Storm Boys because they're super fast and they do secondary is good. Not too much to talk about there. That was um, that's a pretty straightforward list. Mostly we're just, uh, we're basically doing the same thing that we did in, in 9th edition, but instead of uh, a billion, instead of three kill rigs, it's trucks now. Uh, just run into the middle of the table, pinning your opponent in their deployment zone. And then um, nailing in the trucks, and then that is the reason that you take the commandos is that you're basically you're you're basically giving yourself a little bit of an additional option to like alpha strike your opponent or um, or just restrict their movement so they can't really react to the truck push as well as they normally could, and then just forcing you know a ton of exploding attacks with extra strength and stuff is pretty solid. Hey man, huge fan of the channel. I wanted to reach out and ask what would be the best way to contact you for business purposes. Cheers. Hey, Kyle Cormack, thanks for the super chat. I appreciate you. Um, my business email should be on my channel description. Uh, I think it is uh, trevi at tactical-tortoise.com is the best way to get me. Uh, you can also hit me up on Discord. I'm in my Discord server all the time, and if you send me a message there, then that's good. This is uh, this cat is all up in the face. I think they should have added minus one to wound death guard if you're outside contagion range. So, like, if they shoot you, then you're minus one to win them. I could see that. You could also just make it, like, super punishing if you if you can't shoot them, right? Infiltrate is a must versus drop pods. Are drop pods really the issue currently? Turn one deep strikes are seem kind of rare and not very strong um, in this edition. I don't know if I, there, are, there are many turn one deep strikes that are super problematic right now. But I could be wrong. I don't know about that. Um. All right, what else we got? Uh, Adeptus Custodes. How about them Custodes? Scotty B over here at Hometown 40K. Four and one with Custards. Uh, we had a Blade Champion. A Shield Captain and Trajan Valoris. So the shield captain gives you a right to battle effect, which is solid for, um, especially for arcane genetic alchemy, so you can minus some damage. He has ceaseless hunter, so he uh, has a, a once per game reactive move. And then the blade champion granting advance and charge to you know once per game. Two big units of custodian guards, so probably, I imagine uh, that we see the blade champion one of them, the shield captain the other, and then Trajan can join into the custodian wardens. Um, it's interesting. I, I think people are kind of like, there's, they're switchy swatching between the custodian wardens and the, um, uh, and the custodian guard a lot because they both bring different things to the table. And I think it was, it, it's interesting how different they are. The custodian wardens are sort of an immovable object, especially once you apply minus some damage to them. Um, they they get their once per game four plus feel no pain so they're basically like you you effectively can't kill them one turn of the game um you can kill several of them but you probably won't wipe the unit and it's for certain you won't wipe the characters inside the unit 
Uh, the Custodian Guard, however, hit way harder because they get rerolls almost all the time. So you're you're sort of pushing the Custodian Guard to do damage, but the Custodian Guard are much easier to kill. Uh, and on top of that, they also lose a melee or one of their one of their um, spears if they take a Vexillus, which the Wardens do not do. So the Wardens actually um, are are more incentivized to take a Vexilla, whereas the Custodian Guard would probably die once they get out in the open. But with um, this full army being able to deep strike, like having access to rapid ingress is really strong. The Alaris, the um, Alaris custodians are super duper good. I think they have a ton of shots because they all have the two shot guardian spears plus a blast a grenade launcher, and they get full wound rerolls against character units, which is a lot of the frontline units in the game. So they're going to be blasting and rerolling all of their wound rolls. So the damage output from those Alaris custodians is actually kind of insane. Uh, we then have a little exaction squad at the end. I love how long this entry is, by the way, because everyone's got like a different weapon. <laughs> so for a 35 point unit, it's longer than almost the rest of the uh, Custodes army combined. But those guys are just going to be holding backline objectives. I think you save yourself points off taking prosecutors. Do you even save your post out points? How many points is a prosecutor squad? Because they, are, you can take prosecutors in fours. Uh, I guess you save yourself five points. Prosecutors are ten points model. Hot damn! So you save you save ten points taking two exaction squads over prosecutors. They're a little bit easier to kill because they're five models to begin with, so you blast them, and they have a worse saving throw. Um, but it's kind of six of one half of the other. And then a vindicare assassin to shoot people's characters in hold an objective. Pretty good. Grab cannons or drop pods are scary for in a lot of vehicles. Are they? Because they're only AP1. I don't know if they're that great. Can't charge out of a drop pod because it counts as a transport that has moved. I haven't... I didn't consider that, but that definitely seems like how that works. That's wild. <laughs> I did not think about that at all. Does the drop pod not have any uh, stuff for that? You know, large space to get them and the unit in range, yeah. Especially if you're running, like, s units that are range-dependent. It's a little bit easier, like, on the, the aforementioned grav cannons are, are they're okay. Um, and it's a little bit easier for them because they can shoot, like, out to the maximum distance at any range. But if you're shoot if you're dropping something like Stern Guard, I think, of Rapid Fire, right? Or any Flamer units, then you want them to be... Um, uh, you want them to be as close as possible, and then having that the area not be screened out is super difficult. The exhaustion squad entry is preposterous. Yeah, it's so fucking long, right? Because <laughs> everyone has a slight, like, a, has a bunch of different weapons and slightly different equipment. Absolutely wild. Yeah, I mean, you can anti-vehicle two plus all you want, but if you don't, if your opponent saves it all, it doesn't really do that much. Um, I don't know. And then also, if you obviously if you hit any matchups that don't take vehicles, you're just like a sad panda. <laughs> the soul guilt scanner. Yeah, what is it? The exaction squad is uh. Let's look at these models. Here they are. Here's this guy. Which is the scanner guy? This is such a 40k unit. So that's a shotgun guy. That's the medic pack guy. That's just a dude with manacles. This guy's a... This is just like the gimp from uh, Pulp Fiction. Basically. Basically. <laughs> Uh, this guy has a shotgun that's also a rifle, right? Because it's like a, it's called like a shot rifle or something. Uh, and then that's just a dude pistol. I like the models. They are cool. Yeah, they are. They are the law. <laughs> 
Um, interesting that they they uh, printed a, a cheap five model unit for uh, Imperial Agents to take because you'd think they would have have learned their lesson after like Void's Men at Arms and individual acolytes and the endless number of times they print Imperial Agents that you can take in super small numbers. But no, they just keep printing them. Chat. They won't stop. Can't stop. Won't stop. Um. All right. So besides Eldar and Imperial Knights. Those are all of the lists that were X1. There were actually a lot of GTs this weekend that still played 9th edition, which is a little bit sad to see when I was going through results. So um, obviously not talking about those ones. We can take a quick look at Imperial Knights. I think for the most part, we've, we've kind of seen what they've done so far. Um, ooh, this one's all big knights, though. Two Armager Warglaves uh, and an Eversaur Assassin. An Eversaur? Whoa. Uh, so it's Canis Rex, a Crusader, an Errant, and a Paladin. That's cool. The Errant with Mysterious Guardian, so he can teleport and he can deep strike. The Knight Crusader gets plus one to hit with guns to two things, and we have two Warglaves. So we're doing it twice. All right. And then Canis Rex. Well, that's a little bit different. It's a little bit more, uh, more... More big nighty than I think we've seen before. Plus, an Eversaur Assassin's really interesting. 40k Bra was won by Candice Rex Crusader Warden. I think that's sort of the normal composition that we typically see. No um, Assassins, though, which is interesting. And then that was followed up by Crusader Paladin Warden. So it's kind of the same. Uh, but we've swapped Canis Rex for a Paladin and run the use the extra points to buy the Assassin. Fair enough. Oh, and we've taken uh, <laughs> enhancements on all of them. So Warden has the double Bondsman, uh, Paladin locks objectives, and the Crusaders minus one AP. Hell yeah. Drop pod assault only allows the drop pod to deep strike turn one. Embarked models auto get out, but can only be placed more than nine inches. Maybe it's not about being able to charge. Yeah. Well, get wrecked, drop pod. Yeah, because they specifically come out of reserve, and units that came out of reserve are, are con considered to have completed a normal move, right? So that unit that's disembarking is uh, automatically disembarking from a move to transport. Unfortunate. Unfortunate. Enough Imperial agents to make a faction, but still can't. Can you not? Do you, do you have to, 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 to determine a detachment for them? Is that part of the uh, list building criterion? Where's the list building section of the core rules? Got my core rules open right here. Oh, yeah. Step, step four is select a detachment. Select detachment rules. Sad. Yeah, that's too bad. Ripperonis. No Porphyrian. Yeah, I mean, the Porphyrian. I mean, obviously, the Porphyrian's a little bit tough to get, right? So I think that we're not always going to be seeing Porphyrians across the table because they're, you know, a little, di little difficult to uh, obtain. But also, um, I think it's a little eggs and baskety because it's a big, expensive unit that basically is only good at shooting other knights. It's okay at shooting infantry, but it's not 700 points of okay at shooting infantry. So, like, would you rather have a Porphyrian, or would you ever have, like, 1.7 regular big knights? And uh, most of the time, you want, like, two big knights rather than the Porphyrian. But uh, the Porphyrian's kind of the mirror breaker there. I don't know if knights matchups do enough damage to kill a Porphyrian, and the Porphyrian for sure kills a knight every turn. Uh, websites in the video description chat. Uh, also, X think exclamation point list will get you there in the in the chat. Um, we're just on the discount games tournament report site. Raise the cost of smaller knights. Yeah, I, I think that that is uh, that is probably where imperial knights are a little bit overtuned. I don't know if the big knights are that great because they are very bad at tactical objectives. So you basically have to have a locking like a fixed objective set that you want to be playing with them, but they're not that great at any of them. The little knights give them a ton more flexibility and are super cheap for their output. Um, both their resilience and their output are, are significantly better than 140 points or 150 in the case of the uh, the Chaos Knights. I, I honestly, 
you know, beyond tower and keyword being a little bit problematic right now, um, honestly, knights should just function like normal units. And I kind of hope that that's the change that they make this week now that we're seeing some changes to towering happen. Um, I, and I would like to see, you know, obviously that take place, but then also just a little bit of a bump to the armagers. And I think the faction's in a solid place if that's the case. Also, maybe, maybe we nerf tank shock. Maybe walkers can't do tank shocks. <laughs> I think that might be a, <laughs> another problematic interaction that I don't love. Yeah. Yeah, I... <laughs> Like, Knights players always complain that, like, well, you can shoot me and it sucks. And you're like, well, yeah, I probably shouldn't be able to. Like, a, a towering unit, like, doesn't, do, it doesn't, isn't typically defensively, like, you know, defensive enough to, to be, uh, to require towering, you know what I mean? Or to, to, like, counteract the downside of towering, which is that, like, a bunch of anti tank guns shoot you on the first turn. And, and then the, the obvious, counterplay that they introduced was that oh well what if you could just shoot back the units with if you yourself had towering but then it just becomes this alpha strike game where whoever goes first shoots the other person's ability to kill them and then the game's over which is toxic and lame walkers are indeed not tanks yeah it's a little bit weird because there's very few non like non walker tanks that have strong melee it's like basically the corn lord of skulls um and then letting that thing tank shock is like probably fine but all, all the melee vehicles in the game almost exclusively are walkers. And so why you allow walkers to both heroically intervene and tank shock is like, why do they get all the buffs? Why is being a walker just better than being a tracked vehicle in the 41st millennium? It's a little bit strange. Um, all right, chat. Uh, I did play a game this weekend. Uh, I can run through. I posted my my result, my, my uh, games on Twitter. I'll just pull up my Twitter feed instead of going digging through my uh, digging through my Google photos. I played Thousand Suns. I played a largely unpainted Thousand Suns army. Although I am I am pr uh, happy to uh, an announce that a lot of it's painted now. Um, or at least Magnus is, and the Forge Fiend's almost done. It's actually on my desk right now. Ooh, here he is. Look at him. Look at this pretty little guy. Very rare. Uh, and then I just basically have to get to the infantry after that. Um, I have a, a Mutalith Vortex Beast stand-in right here that I made in Blender from a bunch of different things. It's basically like a big, um, like a Tomb King's cavalry model that I found online. And then uh, it has a bunch of like sci-fi tank bits that represent the big guns. Um, but mostly, yeah, I wanted to give them a go because um, they're much more interesting than Tyranids right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh tyranids are super boring and have very little sort of interesting play I, I think they're 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 honestly much better than i gave them credit for to begin with and they're they're not too bad but um i, I wasn't really interested in playing the biovor game um so I'm playing thousand suns because they actually have a psychic phase and uh magnus the red is basically a big hive tyrant which is my favorite thing ever <laughs> so let's go um it should be true line of sight from everything. <laughs> Indeed. Just trolling over here, chat. I see you. Um, my picture show up here. So Twitter doesn't resize very well. All right, that's good enough. Uh, I played against, uh, let's see, Black Templars round one. Basically, um, it was a, a pretty stock standard kind of classic Black Templars list. Had a big Terminator brick, a couple of big bricks of Primaris Crusaders, um, and a uh, an attack bike squad. The devastating wound, like grab gun, or uh, it was actually an outrider squad, but the devastating wound outrider squad with the uh, the bike chaplain in it. Um, we played Don of War deployment. Uh, I was lucky enough. Get my zoom it out. Uh, I was lucky enough to go first, and my opponent had very little shooting. He just had one Redemptor Dreadnought. So basically, his Redemptor Dreadnought sort of, sort of kind of covered this line um, down the middle. We were on the old US Open layouts, by the way. So the uh, the the classic big squares. These were first floor line of sight blocking. I think I was kind of hoping that they would call them infinitely line of sight blocking, so that you got you got to get around the towering keyword, but that wasn't the case. Um, he decided to put 
a big Primaris Crusader brick. You can kind of see Hellbrecht in the back over there. Oh, not what I wanted. Um, you can kind of see Hellbrecht in the back over here. And then also the Terminator squad in there. So basically all I did was I just ran uh, chaff, like rubric rain squads into the in front of that unit so that they couldn't push to the rest of the army. And then uh, we had a peace trade over the middle for a while, but eventually uh, I won that. Magnus started in the back over here, so he didn't get shot round one and basically just ran around the side. Killed all of the utility units in the side over here and then pushed to the center and then had an epic duel with Helbrecht. So Helbrecht, Magnus went to the middle to hold the middle objective. Uh, Helbrecht made a big charge with his Primaris Crusader squad. Um, actually, it was just an Assault Intercessor squad, but that gave them full root wound rerolls, which was pretty good. Uh, he did a bunch of damage. I think he brought Magnus to about half, and then Magnus epic dueled him uh, <laughs> because it was fun and uh, and beat the crap out of Helbrecht in the swing back. Um, and at that point, that was basically my, my opponent's only unit left. His uh, Terminator said, unfortunately, they'd pushed out. They killed all these guys and pushed out, got twisted and shot with the um, Forge Fiend and the, the Rubric unit that were over here, and eventually um, failed their charge with the Rubric unit and just got, got wiped out. Unfortunately, there's a, I think it was a seven or an eight and my opponent just didn't roll it. A little sad. If you can only use tank truck once per phase and the output is capped, it's fine on walkers. Yeah. The, yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. Six mortal wounds off of like a strength 20 weapon is pretty insane. And then the fact that Canis Rex can can trigger it twice a second time is kind of nuts. So you can get 12 mortal wounds for one TP basically. Um, on two, if you charge with two separate knights, which you, a lot of times will be. Um, so we got we got out round one pretty well. Uh, round two, I played against the Shadow Sword. This is a very cool guard army. And unfortunately, we had a really tough mission. Let's see if I took, I didn't take a picture i think i had removed the objective mats by the time i take the picture but it was a five mission objective so we were in corner deployments uh and then it was the i want to say it's a sweeping clear card where there's an objective in each corner and one in the center but then we had the um primary mission where the objective in the center got removed so I was sort of expecting to be able to play this game where we could, and these were preset, to be fair, these were preset um, by the TOs beforehand. They would just use the, the selections from the document. Um, but I was expecting to be able to, to sort of play in the center here with, I had, I had a bunch of five man rubric squads and I could push to the center and try to, to push for two primary objectives to outscore my opponent. But the fact that the center objective was removed and my opponent had three manticores, one, two, three, plus a Basilisk, plus a bunch of mortar teams in here. So he had a ton of artillery, and then anything that moved in the center of the table got killed by the Shadow Sword. So it was a good army composition. He had two units of Scout Sentinels going around each side, plus he had some Rough Riders. So he had like some some solid like forward operation and, and like counter punch, um, if you played too aggressively against him. Uh, and I was immediately like, well, this is actually gonna suck because my opponent uh, went first, pushed Scout Sentinels to this objective, that was uh, on his side of the table over here and killed indirect fired all of my units that had had pushed up this way. I, I scout moved cultists over here to try to hold this objective. They all died. I the next turn double moved a rubric squad over there. They died. Every all the artillery just blew up whatever was on that objective. So I kept only scoring one 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 uh, primary every turn and my opponent was scoring two. So I was like, well, this is problematic. So I ended up uh, in order to deal with the objective over here. I had my two 10 man warp flamer squads. Uh, and basically just pushed them as hard as I could on that objective. And I ended up clearing it. I contested it one turn with uh, one of my units. And then Aramanzi that came in and cleared it. I just killed everyone on the objective. So we were actually able to keep my opponent down on primary. And then uh, the Shadow Sword, because of the new rules where you can only see through a ruin if you're wholly within it. Um, the Shadow Sword didn't have the movement because it had to go around these walls to pass this terrain feature in the center. So there was this arc where my opponent couldn't see this area. And if you'll notice, that's exactly where Magnus sat. So Magnus basically just chilled there the entire game. And I would just double move a rubric squad in front of the shadow sword every turn to prevent it from moving forward to shoot Magnus. So we never had the the sweet fight between Magnus and the Shadow Sword. I did it did have an engine seer behind it, so it was getting a four plus invulnerable save. And I uh, did get one of my sorcerers around the back and went to doom bolt him. And I rolled a one. I didn't do it. I only did like one damage. 
Um, but I was hoping I could doom bolt him and then remove his invulnerable save, twist him the next turn, and kill him with Magnus. But that didn't happen, so I just didn't even try. <laughs> so Magnus held down this flank pretty hard. Um, I kept feeding Rubric Marines into the into the objective and into the Shadow Sword over and over again. By the end of the game, uh, I had these two objectives, and I was left with just the Forge Fiend and Magnus. But they had held those objectives down enough that I won by seven points. So that was definitely, um, honestly, like one of the one of the the most difficult games of uh, of tenth edition I played yet. It was like extremely close and super tense. Um, and we and we eventually got there, but <laughs> it was not. It was it, it looked hairy for a while. It was a very difficult. Um, that was a very difficult uh, uh, mission selection to play against artillery, which I think was in, an interesting. Um, it makes the missions a little bit interesting. Um, final round, I was against uh, Leagues of Votan, which is a little bit of a punch down, unfortunately. Uh, I didn't take any pictures in the game because I just forgot. I think I was tired. And uh, he was running like triple land fortress, um, six Sagittor ATVs, if I remember correctly, or five Sagittor ATVs, and then a bunch of units inside them. And basically, we were played Dawn of War deployment, or Hammer Anvil deployment, excuse me. Just ran everything to the middle of the table. And uh, I, I sort of chilled for a turn. I didn't commit until I wanted his units to disembark the transports. Um, and... Uh, Round two, just like full scent, rapid ingress. A, I went, I went second. Rapid ingress the flamer squad over here, and then between that flamer squad and all the rubric marines running around over here, and Magnus shooting its stuff in the middle, basically killed a bunch of stuff, and then kept killing stuff. I don't know. Leagues of Otan, <laughs> it's not, not a good faction right now, unfortunately. They can't really deal with Twist of Fate because uh, they have no invulnerable saves anywhere. Their weapons are like wildly in, 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 inconsistent because they don't have any rerolls basically anywhere at all. They're like reliant on taking on getting um, judgment tokens on you to get plus one to hit, but then they're just like hitting on threes, no rerolls, so anything could happen. Um, a single Magna Rail Cannon went, got through a save this game. Uh, get devastating wounds on the um, Mutilith Vortex Beast, which has a feel no pain, so it didn't even take that much damage. And it was just like kind of a crap show, honestly. Um, kudos to my opponent for getting to 3-0 and with, uh, with Leagues of Otan, honestly, but man, was it a little bit rough at the end <laughs> when... when um, Magnus, Magnus killed all three Hecaton land fortresses, by the way. Uh, almost entirely was shooting. I think entirely was shooting because he would just twist them and then full reroll and kill it. And it was like, okay, cool. Uh, faction doesn't have a response to that. And it felt a little bit bad. So uh, please fix Leagues of Otan. <laughs> this faction sucks. Um, but that was my tournament. I 3 and owed it. I, I dodged Eldar. The other undefeated players were Eldar. And fortunately, we had three Eldar players. One of one of them got a mirror match round two. So one Eldar player got knocked out round two by another Eldar player. So we were able to sneak through the Eldar to get to the top. Um, I'm going to play again this weekend. I'll continue to play Thousand Suns. We'll see if we can keep dodging Eldar or if even Eldar survive until this weekend. We'll see. But uh, I'm crossing my fingers. <laughs> well, <laughs> see how it goes. Um, but yeah, that was my event. Uh, I'm very much enjoying Thousand Suns right now, by the way. And I do have my painted Magnus. He's actually... Here he is. Uh, I'm a pretty guy. Um, the faction's super fun. I don't know. It's, like, pretty solid. Uh, um, and it has a lot of, like, interesting technology you can use. But it doesn't feel, um, like, super, like, ridiculously powerful. It's, it's definitely better than most of the other stuff at kind of the mid-tier, but it doesn't even come close to the top stuff. Um... So that's pretty fun. I like it. Three free stratagems idea turns many things more powerful than they should be. I can, yeah, I can definitely agree with that. The the fact that the free stratagem also doubles up your stratagems is kind of wild. That was not a printed Magnus, by the way, chat. The only printed part on Magnus is the head. Uh, yeah, I, uh, that's just a that's a plastic magnet. You can even see the you can even see the mold lines, <laughs> the uh, the gaps I didn't fill in. Oh, I'm on my my screen, my, uh, my face stream here. Uh, the only 3D 3D printed part is the head. I I got him a sweet head from uh, um I don't know some website. I think it was intended for an action figure because it was like that scale, but I printed it out because I wanted him to be a cool Egyptian bird guy. And then we leaned really, I'm leaning really heavily into the, like, the sort of the Egyptian, like, you know, gold and turquoise theme for the, the scheme, which I think came out pretty good so far. I'm pretty happy with it. 
It looks good, so that's fun. No horns on the chest. If he has horns in the chest, how does he swing his spear? He just gets stuck. Ugh. Ugh. That sucks. Glad Forge Fiends are worth a damn. Yeah. Forge Fiends are great, honestly. Uh, I mean, the like the worst one. First of all, why doesn't Death Guard get Forge Fiends? Real talk. That doesn't make any sense. That's stupid. Um, the worst one is probably the World Eaters one, and it's still okay. It just forces Battle Shock on things that it shoots, which is not a great ability, but like, it's fine. I think the intended play is that you shoot something and then it Battle Shocks and it can't interrupt you in the fight phase. Uh, but it's just gonna succeed. It's check. Like, who, we all know. We all understand how Battle Shock works. You force your opponent to take a check that they will then pass. Uh, the best one is probably the the um, Heretic Astartes one. The Heretic Astartes one is nuts. It does a billion mortal wounds. It averages like ten to twelve. It's insane. <laughs> um, but even the Thousand Suns one, like it's good against sort of mass multi wound infantry. Uh, it's like three individual blast weapons. It fired against the. Uh, in the, the Astro Militarum game, it killed like 10 guardsmen in one shot just because it they were a brick of 20 and he just gets a billion extra attacks. So like it's good at clearing infantry, it's cheap, and it gives a, it suppresses people to shoot, so it gives a minus one to hit. So it's just like a good utility piece, honestly. So which is good because when the Forge Fiend originally came out, it was one of my favorite it was my probably one of my favorite looking models. I was like, whoa, this thing is so sick. I love it. It's like this big it's like Straight up a demon engine. It's just a demon that they put armor plating on and it stabbed, strapped a bunch of guns to. And I absolutely loved that. And I actually started a 40k army back in 5th edition when that <laughs> model released so I could play that model. Uh, and then I got tired. I got bored of it and I didn't actually paint it. So, <laughs> oops. Um, but I'm so, I am psyched that Forge Fiends are good. And it's cool to see them because they are like a quintessentially Chaos Space Marine unit. Uh, the, the Dark Mechanicus, like, to Warpsmith Demon Engine build is real in Chaos Base Marines, um, and th all those styles of units are really good, so that's really fun to see. I guess maybe it's because they have the Plague Wars Crawler chat. I guess that kind of makes sense. Have I seen the Sons of Egypt line from War Games exclusive? I haven't. What is that? Let's take a look. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Ooh, these are pretty hot damn that looks great <laughs> holy shit <laughs> do they have that as a collection am i gonna get like demonetized by showing off this uh is this is this one of those websites where they, it's all it's all booba marines? Yeah, it is a bit. It is a bit booba marines. Where are the? Uh, can I search? Is there a search bar? No. I can't find it anymore. Anyway, that one that one that was was pretty good, for sure. It does look sweet. So, I don't know. I'll keep playing Thousand Suns. I'm, uh, I like them. They look good. They're fun. It's pretty sweet. The 20 Scarab calls from them. Oh, these guys are... These are Tao Waifu people? Ugh. Ugh. That's heretical right there. You can't fraternize with the Xenos. Get out of here. This is why Femme Marines... When I Female Marines? Lady Marines? Because, uh... Because this website exists? Because this website already sells them, so you, people will have 3D printed all of their Lady Marines. Um, get some, like, interesting demon ladies. It's kind of cool. Oh, like, Chaos Sisters of Battle. Like, these are Zephyrim? Ah, uh, that's fun. He's an Inquisitor dude. Uh, like, Wild West Inquisitor guy. These are, pretty, these are pretty sweet. I think I've seen a lot of these. I don't remember all of them, though. It's like a Death Cult Assassin, probably. Real cyberpunk energy. Hmm. Oh, yeah. That's just straight up a Mantis Blade from Cyberpunk. Fair enough. <laughs> I get it. I see what's up. Hmm. 
Anyway, chat. Um, don't have much else to talk about today. We could dive into some RTT or some some uh, lower rank results if we want to for a little bit. I know somebody was asking for Grey Knights. Um, could do that for a couple minutes out here if people are interested. Otherwise, uh, that's all I have to uh, discuss. What are people into? Kind of a slow week today, honestly. There weren't as many events playing 10th edition as I expected, and uh, most of them were won by Eldar, and even then, Eldar is getting a like change later on today or this week. So, like, who knows if that's if even those lists are gonna remain reasonable for any length of time. Let's find a Green Knights list, chat. That's what I'm going to do. Let's set up a list search for this weekend. Oops, I didn't select the faction. Uh, I messed it up. Grey Knights, where are you? I can't find Grey Knights in the search. Oh, they're there. What do we got? Um. What is this result? Yikes. Zero, 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 three, nine. We've got a three and two from, uh, from Alpine. Or four and two, excuse me. Uh, three and two. What do we got from this four and two? Triple Librarian. Let's go. Castle and Crow. Caldor Drago. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four Terminator squads. Plus a Strike squad. Plus a Purifier squad for Castle and Crow. Two. Ten. Yeah, ten Purifiers with Incinerators. I was wondering if the uh, Incinerator Flamer units would be would be good. Looks like this is getting cut off a little bit. Let me fix that. Um, her Gator squads with like quad incinerators seem okay, but they are seem expensive as well. 160 for a flamer for a flamer unit is a little bit pricey. Um, but the purifier squads shoot enough that it's probably fine because they also shoot. They go three times three shots per because Castling Crow increases their number of shots right by one. Um, so that actually seems solid. The downside, I guess, is you give up the um, additional mortal wounds from Boldus's squad, like Terminator squad, but that might not be that big of a deal. It is a little bit sad that uh, Grey Knights are kind of... I guess, I mean, every every Grey Knight player like that I've ever spoken to has been like, man, I really want Terminators to be good because, uh, you know, I love Terminators and all I want to play is Terminators. And now Terminators are good and that's kind of all you can play. <laughs> you're like Terminator. You're the Terminator and Strike Squad show, and Terminators are mostly just delivery systems for your characters. So it's not even like you're actually playing Terminators. Uh, and for the most part, you're mostly just playing primary objectives. That said, uh, Grey Knights seem okay. Uh, I'm kind of interested to play Grey Knights. I do own this army. I played Grey Knights in Eighth Edition, so I could just rock this if I wanted to. Uh, and I'm kind of interested to play it because it does seem kind of technical and pretty cool. Um, where can you get the STL? I'll pull out the, the, let me, let me grab the STL for this. Um, it's from my mini factory. Uh, I'll pull out the STL I used. It is this one here. Ta-da. Uh, it's, uh, it's got like bits for an action figure. I think it's supposed to go into like a printable set of action figure stuff, but um, it 
it scales just fine to stick on Magnus, and it looks good. Uh, I had to like green stuff the connection point pretty hard, but and it's not perfect. It's a little bit of a weird angle because of the uh, I don't know what you call those things, the things that like trail down from the headpiece, but it looks fine, I think. Oh, the zero 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 was the Green Knights playing as a TO. That's fair. Yeah. Anyone made any results using Tyranid Horde armies? I don't believe so. We could uh, we could take a quick look at the search here. Can't edit the search. That's super weird. We can look at Tyranid lists if we want to. See if we can find some interesting ones. Tyranids. Um, let's see. Talked about this one. Here's a 4 1 from Luxembourg open. Uh, this is like reasonably hordy, I guess. It's 12 zoanthropes. Uh, Trigon. A Trigon's actually 180 points. Is that real? I think they work a little cheaper than that. They are. Hmm. I like the Trigon. I think the Trigon's good for like backline disruption. I think that's one thing that Tyranids don't do very well is they don't like Trixie. They're, they aren't Trixie at all, and I think the Trigon helps with that. Because you can... It's basically unscreenable if you rapid ingress it. So you can rapid ingress it in the most obnoxious places in the world. And then it's fast enough that if your opponent's not like super far... like. You're, it probably has a, a charge the next turn on anything that is like re relevant. Um, the problem is that it like takes up this frontline spot. Like it costs as much as six Oanthropes, and that's a little bit expensive. And it's not, it doesn't hit that hard because it's only strength nine. But at least it can like kill a bunch of Space Marines holding an objective or something and take it from them. Uh, one Malaceptor, double Lictor, and one Exocrine, triple Biovore, double Barb Gaunt, 30 Hormigons, and 10 Gargoyles, plus a Neuro Tyrant and a Hive Tyrant. I'm interested to hear... So people are all, are running the Tyrant Guard. I'm interested to hear people's thoughts about the Tyrant Guard, because I found Tyrant Guard to be basically worthless. You're, if, if they were in line of sight, they and the Tyrant were dead anyway, because they're not even that hard to kill. Everybody's teching to kill Knights. Killing three Tyrant Guard is not hard. Um, and they don't do anything <laughs> so but, but they like take up a ton of real estate and they make the tyrants unit like arbitrarily so, so much bigger so i was i don't know i didn't like them when i played them um but i'm interested to hear if the other people have had that uh, opinion i guess maybe they they might honestly be um for the neuro tyrant the Narrow Tyrant doesn't feel like it necessarily needs a Tyrant card unit, but at least he gives him plus one to hit. And he honestly, like, kind of wants to be closer to your opponent's army than the, the Hive Tyrant does, because he wants to use his cool flamethrower. Interested in pinch proofing the door? Oh, behind me. Yeah, she did. Uh, to be fair, she did that to herself because she had got her pot stuck in it. Yeah, I think the narrow tire might be the place for them. Um, I, that module seems okay. The problem is that like I'm not even that impressed by the high tire the, by the tyrant card's melee output. Like you're buffing, you're kind of like turd polishing at that point. Because they're like three attacks, AP one, two damage. Like, all right. <laughs> so you attack nine times with them. Like, all right. That doesn't, it's not that good. And AP one is not that good. Like, I would rather have three Zoanthropes. Like, this list has only, this list could be running another Zoanthrope unit. Which, to be clear, it's it's a travesty that the uh, t the Narrow Tyrant can't join two Zoanthrope units. That is unacceptable. Because it's just a big zoanthrope.
I guess, yeah, if you're playing the Neuro Tyrant, you probably take Crushing Claws, I guess. But either way, right? It's only three attacks and two damage at that point. They're like AP2 two damage, right? I'm not even that excited about it. Yeah. Yeah, it would be. It's nuts that they can't join join zones or units. It's a it's a it's definitely problematic. Uh, this one we just looked at earlier. All right, chat. Any other factions we want to take a quick peek at? A quick gander before I wrap things up. I think we're getting getting up to the uh, the hundred minute mark here, so I'll uh, I'll hop off in a little bit. Anybody else that we want to uh, dive into before I jump out? <laughs> Love neophytes and aberrants. Yeah, I know there's a lot of Gene, a lot of like Tyranid players just hopping on Gene Sealer Call right now. Adeptus Auroritas. Take a quick look, I guess. Oops, that's not what I wanted to click on. Hmm. That can't be right. Oh, because I clicked Minister, I'm not Auroritas. Uh, oh boy, these are not amazing. This is not a uh, inspiring showing of win win rate here, chat. Oh, this is not quite on the screen. It's a lot of red. <laughs> Got red in our ledger here today. Uh, Steve Carr over here at Pigeon Lake Basement Bonanza went three and zero though. What is this event, by the way? Oh, it was five players. Well, you know, gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, Hospitaler, one Imagifier, one Junith Eruita, Morvan Vaal, double Castigator, Secrescence, Crusader, double Crusaders, double Extra, triple Exorcist, hot damn, plus Paragon War Suits, plus Seraphim, and a Knight Crusader. Yeah, I think the the Knights is basically where I where I've been seeing sisters be pushed. Um, a lot of sisters running like um, even like Porphyrians and stuff because. Um, the sisters, like, unironically, the sisters have a good secondary game because Zephyrim and Seraphim are so, like, it's just really, really, really efficient. Um, but their, like, their anti-tank game just sucks so hard. And so if you take the big knights, they have a lot more play there. And they can, like, clear infantry just fine. Like, everybody's got hand flamers and stuff. Um, but they they run into so much trouble shooting at big stuff. And, and being able to ally in a knight certainly helps there. So I think most of the time... We're going to be seeing sisters drop in knights. The paragons plus Morven help a little bit as well, um, but you will typically rapid ingress them rather than uh, like starting them on the table because their their threat range isn't super far. So you want to get them in melter range of something and then like deliver that full reroll multi melter shot. But even then, it's like a little bit. At least like I don't know, they have a decent chance to hit and wound. Uh, and then you can sub in sixes for damage, potentially, or w at least one. Uh, and then the back last is a bunch of battle tanks. So it's kind of the tank show, plus a bunch of jump infantry to do secondaries with. Uh, which seems fine. Actually, it's it's a little bit more of like a mixed Imperium list than it is a Sisters list, but I, I don't think it's that bad, actually, as an archetype. I think if you run into problems, if you try, try to include Sisters Melee, because Melee is already not good. Strength 3 Melee is even worse. And then Strength 3 Melee, they got like sort of its its power level like quartered from 9th edition. is not even that great either. So you're you're kind of just shooting at people. Like with Death Guard, take a knight. Yeah, Death Guard have an interesting. The Chaos Knights have, uh, because Chaos are, are more about debuffing opponents than Imperium armies are, um, they actually have a, a very good interaction with their knight allies. Um, you're kind of, you actually have synergy with, with Chaos Knights if you're including them in other factions, because you can, like, 
You can twist stuff if you're playing um, uh, Thousand Sons. You can like uh, Nurgle's Gift stuff if you're playing Death Guard. Um, and Imperial Knights is the kind of the other way around. The Knights are are there to like shore up weaknesses that the existing faction has. Like a Death Guard Knight with a Hellbrute staple to it to debuff people at range is actually probably pretty good. If you run like um, the double rapid fire battle cannon guy, because then he's like kind of strength 11, which is pretty good. Uh, he, he impacts strength 10 and 11. What you want is to be like strength 12, I guess, to be able to shoot other knights effectively, but I, I, that's like thermal cannons at that point. And they're so short range. I don't know if you care so much about that. Oh, DG with brigands. Yeah, that makes sense, too. I guess the the little knights are probably better with Death Guard. I think the um, battle cannon guy is, like, insane with Thousand Sons if you can twist somebody. Because he's the downside of him is that he's only AP1. Uh, and the uh, twist gets around that pretty easily. Yeah, I think um, Sisters with Imperial Agents is, is definitely solid. Could even play Sisters with a with Warhound Titan. There you go. Easy. So, yeah, that seems like what the direction we're going in. I imagine these lists probably played a little, like, leaned a little bit harder into Sisters proper. Uh, yeah, it's like all, all Sisters stuff big sister squads, which I don't think is a very good archetype right now. Yeah, retributors, big retributor squads, or normal size retributor squads. You can't make them big anymore. Uh, gotta bring those knights, for sure. Ooh, we're trying penitent engines. Man. I wish, I wish penitent engines were good. The two the two model size is like such a killer for that, that unit. It's so sad. Death Guard with a Warhound, a Knight, and Chaos Demons. Technically legal. The best kind of legal. Yeah, we can take a quick look at Botan. Um, I, I think that is, like, a big downside for these factions that are suffering super hard, is that at least if you are... Um, if you're committed to a faction... If it is a an Imperium or Chaos faction, at least you have additional factions to draw from because you can you can take um, uh, allies. Votan are just stuck because they don't get that option, which is just unfortunate. Yeah, one, two, and three. Oop. Uh, one, two, three Hearthkin Warriors, double Sagittor. Hearth Guard, one Land Fortress, double Pioneers. It's a lot of infantry on the table. Uh, we do have a Thunderkin unit. I found out in, in my game early in this weekend, the Broke Here Iron Master no longer... His his Tech Marine buff just heals for three, but it doesn't grant plus one um, to hit. He only grants plus one to hit to the unit that he's, he's uh, joined. So he doesn't even benefit vehicles besides repairing them, which is nuts. Um, it's, like, so weird. And plus, plus one to hit isn't even that great in the faction because then it doesn't stack with judgment tokens. It's just such a poorly designed faction from the ground up. It's insane. Like, I have no... Yeah, I don't know how you make this, like, consistently well-performing army. Um, I hope that they don't forget these factions when it comes to the the, uh, the balance updates. I hope that, that we see some play with those. Anyway, chat. I think that is going to uh, do it for this week. Kind of a, kind of a slow week, like I said. A little bit of an interim show today. I'm sure next week we'll uh, start to talk about post data slate things. Uh, I'm most likely. So I'm going to work this week. I, I have some planned. Um, what's the word? Uh, some planned 
uh, rules videos to come out. I think I'm going to talk about the fight and charge phases, and I might talk about attack modifiers. So, uh, you know, attacks and things like weapon abilities. Um, so stay tuned for those coming out later this week. Once the um, update comes out, I may do, depending on how extreme it is, I may do an updated tier list, and we might switch a couple things around. There's also, I, I think, a couple things that maybe I under overrated. Um, in my initial sort of uh, off, right off the cuff tier list. But um, other than that, yeah, we're basically just like, we're in the eye of the storm right now, right? We're like, we're, you know, the the we're waiting for this uh, big update to happen and change the whole game and it hasn't yet. So uh, we are crossing our fingers. Didn't talk about them at all in their video. Yeah, we'll see how it, we'll see what they do. Um, I think it, I mean, it should be apparent that they need something and like points could change it right now. Right? Like a, a hearthkin warrior is how much, how many points is a hearthkin warrior? They're expensive as fuck, right? They're like 14 points a model. Yeah. 13.5 points a model, you know, after equipment, you just make this unit a hundred points and suddenly the faction is a lot more playable. The, the problem is that they're like, they're sort of baked around this, this garbage ass infantry unit. That's super expensive and really bad. Um, and they generate judgment tokens based on those models dying, but the models are expensive, and so you don't want them to die. So you just need to make them cheap, and then I think the army is a lot better. That's all there is to it. It's not good because there's still a lot of like anti-synergistic effects inside there, but you know, you make this guy 100 points, you make this guy also 100 points, and a, a 300 point module of two Sagittarius plus 10 Hearthkin Warriors is a lot more stomachable than almost 400 as it is right now. And I think that I don't think that fixes the faction, but it definitely bumps them up a little bit. But, you know, we'll have to see. Uh, between them and Adeptus Mechanicus and probably Sisters, I think those are the ones that really need a little bit of tinkering. And I would love to see it if they just made some little tiny ch edits. Please, just a couple tiny edits. would be great. Um. Anyway, cheers, chat. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pop off. Thanks, everyone, for coming and hanging out. Uh, stay tuned for some videos like I just said. Um, and, uh, yeah, keep it classy, folks. Have a good one, and I'll see you in the next one.